Expectations are relative to the situation that you're in. Standards are relative to what you need in life. So why are there teachers who have such different standards when they teach the same content? Is it ever okay to lower your standards or your expectations? That's what we're talking about today. Welcome to the Teach Bigger Podcast. Welcome to the Teach Bigger Podcast. I'm Chris Pratt. I'm Chris Mosley. And I'm Tyler Lamont. All right, so the 2020-2021 school year is rapidly coming to a close. And there are tears of joy, and that's probably all. I think everyone's just happy about that at this point. Yeah. I haven't heard anyone say I'm going to miss this school year. So we've been You know, through- I, had a, I had a pretty good time. You know, it was pretty nice you know it's pretty <laughs> i've never wanted something to be over so so much uh than this year here okay well it, it I, has I, drained us all yeah this is my last year in the teaching teaching field i am <laughs> i'm, I'm moving, moving on <laughs> I'm gonna, <laughs> you join my pack my podcast my next podcast is going to be a travel podcast we're talking about everywhere we're going to go in 2022 <laughs> uh you heard it here first on this podcast. that's right anyway, no, no so, yeah but definitely definitely yeah. happy so well you know based on kind of how you set us up tyler I, I think this is the time of year where teachers really start to notice things right they notice the injustice um in the department they notice the injustice on the campus in the district And there are lots of teachers at this time of year that voice those opinions. You know, they go around saying, you know, things such as, you know, well, you know, they do this or they do that. And and it's like people are under a lot of stress at the end of the year. We, We finish up standardized testing. You know, high school people are dealing with graduation and grades. And, you know, elementary school people are just the children. They just are running. They're running and, mm. and screaming because everybody's ready to go. <laughs> Wait, let me add this. Also, what you have to deal with is people who are getting new jobs that have already checked out. Oh, yes. the, oh the, yeah. The, you know, I've, I've already accepted my position at a new school, and I am just trying to make it out of this place here. And so the things that I once cared about because I was held to a certain standard and are my evaluation, I don't necessarily care about anymore because now I am not under any evaluation and I'm just mentally checked out. Right. So therefore, I'm that everything go by the wayside. Right. And that yeah. also causes a uh, a systemic effect throughout the school. Right. You know, it reminds yeah. me of a very powerful quote from tina turner laid on me laid on me it was rolling rolling on the river no it was this it was later suckers (laughs) so yeah 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 yeah, okay so what i gotta say about that is that you have to man okay i know we did i think it was season two where we talked about like what it takes in order to break a teacher Mm -hmm. but you really gotta do it because teachers can endure a lot Mm -hmm. a lot yeah so in order for a teacher to completely check out after they've uh, taken another job and like they're just riding it because that affects the entire school that doesn't just affect that classroom because kids or i guess subordinates always look to their superior always look to whoever their leader is and if they're doing something then they think that they can do it right that's why like when you have older kids around younger kids you have to make sure the older kids behave or to make sure that they they behave at a certain level so that way the younger kids don't act like them you know whatever so in order for a teacher to not respect that or understand that or even think anything about that and just completely check out you must have really damaged them <laughs> to yeah. some degree well because right. they're damaging everything else yeah mm-hmm. and it's what, a, uh-huh no i'm saying it's right now you know so many kids are fleeing to my band hall because mm-hmm. they're saying Oh, we're not doing anything. You're like, we haven't been doing anything. And I feel bad, you know, because I'm like, no, go back to class because I'm not going to babysit right now. Even if they're mm-hmm. practicing whatever, I'm like, you need to be in that classroom because whatever teachers, they just stop teaching. Right. They're now, done. But, in, you know. in that teacher's defense, and there are certainly some teachers who aren't doing much from time to time, but also a lot of time in a kid's eyes when they want to do what they want to do, 
their perception is that we're not doing anything. Well, and, and that'll be the story you know, they come and get. Or, or they're like, they're like, we we've already been assigned all our stuff. We've already done all stuff. Mm-hmm. It's all online and blah 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 blah. And so they say that, and I'm like, well, what's the teacher doing? They're like, oh, she's just sitting there. Okay, so <laughs> I mean, I, well, so that I, I so that brings me back to my point that this is the time of year where you know teachers across the campus start to take note. They start to notice their colleagues. They start to notice administration. They start to notice the injustice on the campus that, you know, maybe you are a teacher who you're like, I am teaching bell to bell. I am teaching first day to last day. Like we have things to learn and I'm going to hold kids accountable. We need a high standard. And you start to notice the people around you maybe aren't doing that. And it's challenging because especially if you're in a situation where you share students. Now, if you're in a self-contained class, sometimes this isn't quite as noticeable, but if you're in a situation where you share students, it become it takes a toll on said teacher who's trying to uphold a standard because now the kids are noticing well you're making us do this but miss or mr so and so is not making us do this and yes it, it literally starts to wear you down and so mm-hmm. what we want to talk about today is just this idea of is it ever okay to lower your expectation or to lower the standard so that maybe things run more smoothly i don't know so this is a big deal, and I think, on every campus, everywhere. But it's one that we kind of don't always think about. And sometimes we overlook it because we don't realize that maybe that's what's causing the issue, is that we're, we don't have a unified front as a staff or as teachers. Mm-hmm. Yes. I, I Look, I've been fighting that the entire year with with masks and i'm sure that there's a lot of people out there who can who, who can join me on this look i y'all don't know but i have this i have a big old beard and wearing a mask is extremely uncomfortable i'm not saying that it's the most i'm the most uncomfortable person wearing a mask whatever and co- covid whatever political i don't care about that the point of the matter is that it was a it was a school standard like it was a it was a it was a rule that was put in place, and if you're not upholding that in your classroom, then you're hurting everybody else. And it doesn't matter if it's a mask. You can replace mask with cell phone. You can replace cell phone with talking to friends. Ooh, this thing that kids made up called free time. Whatever it is, <laughs> I don't know. I think maybe a teacher made that up. But anyway, so too, a so, tie, you know what? A tired teacher doing this time right here. Right. I'm sure uh, the idea of free time came right around May. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Man, after, I, after testing, after testing, I hate when students come in. They're like, "Hey, can we have a free day?" And I look at them I'm like, "What is a free day?" You say that, what yeah, is- you, you sure can. It's called Saturday and Sunday. That's mm-hmm. right. We actually give you two of those every week, two back to back. Mm-hmm. You know, and it, it's funny how every time I have a sub, every single one of my students is suddenly complete with all of their work, and then I come back, and this teacher's like, "Yeah, they all completed their work." I'm like, "Well, that's interesting," because I gave them six assignments, and I have nothing turned in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I guess they just had a little right. too too much free time. Yeah, exactly. You know, so as far as the standards go, you know, I tried to be realistic going into this year. So I I was thinking, you know, in my planning, okay, how do I keep the standards that I have, which is I think my standards are pretty high. Expectations are pretty high, you know. Uh, but also being realistic to the the situations that's going on, you know being graceful at times and trying to, you know, understand things. So I came into the year, you know, setting the bar high of like, Hey, we're, we're at school. If we're here, we're going to still be good. So like, we're going to be working, you know, but, and I also told like my other colleague, I'm not going to let things that would normally get under my skin, under my skin. Um, just because it's, you know, throughout this year. So I, it was like a, it was a balance that I had to play this year as far as, keeping the standard and the standard and my expectations high, but also like there's this, there's this saying, no one to hold them, no one to fold them, mm-hmm. that type of thing. Uh, and I try to play a really good balance with that, you know? So like some things I'll just, I'll just let go. Now, I mean, and not, not to, to a detriment of the like learning environment, but just as a certain things that I'd be super, super nitpicky about, you know, mm-hmm. I would just, you know, uh, and then I, then I would push at certain times. So I just wouldn't be, I guess as um, hard as as I normally would be during a normal year, but I still kept the standard, you know, pretty high. Um, and I think because I didn't harp on those things all the time, 
whenever I did, it, it made a huge difference. You know, the whole cell phone thing, you know, uh, mm-hmm. even like last year, the whole cell phone thing, like I would mention it and then I would, you know, I wouldn't even really say the word cell phone. I would say like distractions or whatever like that, you know, and because, you know, a colleague, uh, I don't know, colleague of mine is like, like he wanted to talk about cell phones on the second day. I'm like, no, let's, I mean, let's not, you know, let's harp on like the importance of receiving instruction and then, you know, the other stuff should just kind of go around, you know, come, come with it. So, uh, and then, so if I ever say anything about cell phones, the room is like, what, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and, and it's not a, like a, a huge deal. It's like, a, it's a couple of people that you might have to say one thing every now and then, but it's because I, I fold them on that, but it's not a huge, huge issue, you know, saying, saying in, in this, this day and time. So, I don't know. It's just I think it's knowing to knowing when to fold them, knowing knowing to hold them type of thing, uh, which will keep your sanity one. And then the kids they won't feel like you're, you know, nagging almost. You know <laughs> that type of thing. So anyway, well, I but my say- standards are still high throughout this year. Okay, so from what I gather, what you just said, you're like no one to hold them, no one to fold them, whatever. But in reality, you in, instead of saying okay, I'm gonna nitpick this one item. What is the what, okay? Because the problem is not cell phones. The problem is no. distractions. So you right. could have you could have nitpicked that one cell phone, and then there would have been other distractions. So instead of finding mm-hmm. that one thing, you fought the umbrella of all distractions, and mm-hmm. cell phone w- went in there. So mm-hmm. you actually addressed the cell phone problem along with a hundred other problems mm-hmm. all at once. So I would say it was more of a work smarter, not harder type of deal. When it came to that, I think that was really smart. And I just try to put it on them too, because as soon as I say something like that, they all know exactly what I'm talking about, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, and they all, they all, they all fix it really quickly. So instead of having to call people out, like you put your cell phone up, I, I, I don't take cell phones. And I always say this, I said, you know, I try not to say anything about cell phones because it makes me feel like a middle school teacher. And then it makes them feel really bad. And then, then they, they, uh, they, they put, they, they happen to be, you know, on a cell phone or something like that, they put it up really, really quick because it, it make they don't want no one want, none of them wants to feel like a junior high kid, you know, mm-hmm. during their high school. So anyway, but that's it. But I still kept the you know, throughout this year, I folded a bit more than I normally would. But that's just you know, but I still kept my expectation really pretty high <laughs> because this is my second year at the school, and so you have to kind of create a sense of momentum forward still, mm-hmm. you know. And so I'm still trying to do that. Anyway, well. I guess I guess I'll share my little experience is that so, you know, I'm a CTE course. So my goal is to get these kids certified. But this is also my very first time and I'm dealing with COVID as well, along with a lot of other issues. So um, I came into a program that was not developed at all. Like no kid was getting certified. Kids were coming in there just playing on video games like they weren't doing anything in there. So. I set like I know what the standard is. I know what it takes in order to be a graphic designer in real life because I have a lot of friends who are doing it. It's one of the things that I'm trying to aspire to do myself. So I know where the standard is supposed to be in order to get them what they're supposed to do. Also, the test is pretty cut and dry, very much laid out of the skills that they need to have. So the standard is pretty easy to know where it's supposed to be. But being a new teacher coming in to a class that was once considered a blow off class, and then having students come in and out because of COVID and everything else going on, I had to lower what my expectations were in terms of content and terms of quality of work, just because I knew that it wasn't, it was unrealistic. So I I, I won't say that I lowered my standard per se, because I know the standard's always there and I'm still reaching for it, but I definitely lowered my expectation of what I was expecting to get out of these kids because they had never done any of this before uh my my best example of this is that anytime uh, we were doing any type of animation and i was like having them to draw like a unique character every single time i'd say do not trace anything Kurt, create your own character individually all 25 of those kids in every single class going to google ripping a character and then tracing it and i was like but you know what i mean the bottom line is the expectation isn't so that way I'm worried if they're tracing a character. I'm worried because this is an art class. I'm worried if they can interact with the program. That is the goal of this. So I know a new one to hold them, new one to fold them. So I, I preached it. I didn't say much when I saw it happening. And I was mainly worried about the main standards of understanding the kids to understand their their program. 
And uh, I'll say that even though it's one student, I will be getting one student certified this year, which is a much bigger process uh, or b a bigger deal than I originally thought it was and way harder than it was expecting. So, well, that is a goal accomplished. Uh -huh. Yeah. Good. Congratulations. Good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm actually extremely excited about it. Mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay. So here's, here's a question to kind of guide our thinking. Okay. So I think that when it comes to the educational environment, and there's probably more than this, but I think these are the top two. Okay. You have, you know, behavioral standards or expectations, and then you have, you know, curriculum based standards and expectations. And we've kind of seen both of you have kind of shared, like Mosley talked about those behavioral ones of like distractions. And then Tyler, you talk more of the curricular ones where, you know, basically you had kids that were not at the level they needed to be at. So you had to make some adjustments. So I I'm curious, do you feel that people tend to lower their expectations when it comes to curriculum? or behavior more. And let's take the example that we did at the beginning of the year. I mean, I'm at the beginning of the, the podcast episode today. It, as we approach the end of the year, we see that a lot of teachers begin to struggle with having high expectations in the classroom. So do you think it's more behavioral or more curricular? Ooh. Um, That's hard. That's hard. Yeah. I think... We like to ask hard questions here. That's what we do. We, we ask big questions here. I think. <laughs> um, I think the standards, like along the standards, uh, with behavioral, I believe, mm -hmm. almost, um, because almost sometimes the curriculum is set for you. Okay. Like, here's what you have to, you know. Perfect. Like here's what you have to learn. Blah 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 blah, and then like. The behavioral part, it's almost on you, you know? And so mm -hmm. whenever, I guess, like, if you don't have the energy to be able to enforce mm -hmm. said discipline and stuff like that, and uh -huh. you relax that. But the, curric the curriculum is set for you, and you need to have this done by this time, da da da, da you know? Okay, I'm glad, that, all this, I'm so. glad that you know. said that. Because, can, uh -huh. can you repeat the question? <laughs> yeah, so do you think that as we approach the end of the year, as in this model, that mm -hmm. teachers tend to bend more on behavioral expectations or on curriculum expectations. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what's your answer? I think that they bend more. I think it's a matter of wh which one they bend on first. And I think that they bend on curricular standards first because standardized testing, once it's over, Teachers have this huge load off. Kids have this huge load off or whatever. And the standard goes sh way, 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 way down. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then when the standard goes way down and they feel like they don't, they're not held to that standard, then the behavior goes down because then why do I need to do my work? I already did my test. So mm -hmm. the trickling, right. trickling effect type of thing that uh, yes, we don't, okay. we don't, we're not as rigorous. So then right. the kids know, and then the behavior goes down okay. and that, yes. that, so. because they're not busy. They don't have anything to do. So okay. here, here is the essence of what we're discussing today. And, and this is like my white knuckle moment, right? Because it just frustrates me because as educators, so most of us, and, and I mean, I realize, you know, and, and a lot of people could make a good point for this. So I'm not, I'm not going, if it's not what we're debating today, but most people get irritated with standardized testing. You know, yeah. especially from their state level, because we feel like it controls our lives. We feel like that, you know, it 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 just puts a score on a kid. It doesn't take any of their growth into, you know, into account and, and their circumstances and, and all the things, you know, that we as teachers see. Um, but nevertheless, it is the way it is for most of us. OK, however, as much as teachers get frustrated and hate standardized testing. I go back to this quote that was one of the best quotes I learned in college. I actually learned this when I was in Bible college and is just one of my professors said this and I thought, man, this is good. And I've never forgotten it. And he said this, it was in my class about business. Okay. And he said, you don't get what you expect. You get what you inspect. And I thought that is so true because no. You can have an expectation, but if you don't inspect 
the people who are supposed to be meeting the expectation, it doesn't rise to that level. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people don't have the same expectation or standard that you have. Okay. So here we go. This is our problem. And in both situations, I agree with you. Like Mosley, you said you think the first to go is the behavioral thing. Mm -hmm. And my answer to that would be, I completely agree Mm -hmm. because curriculum gets inspected. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When you put it like that, you know. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, the curriculum gets inspected. You've got, you've got, you know, downtown, you know, of your district comes and they send the specialist and the superintendent and the assistant superintendent they come in your room they're they're checking your plcs they're making sure everything's on target you got to turn your lesson plans to your ap how many of those people ever come and watch what you're doing with classroom management exactly right and that's and that's probably the number one reason why teachers are so scared with, when someone comes into their classroom right because you don't get what you expect you get what you inspect and everyone's always scared that they're doing it wrong Exactly. So one of the reasons behavior is the first to go, especially toward the end of the year, is because teachers know that no one's following up on that. Okay. And then the second thing was what Tyler said, which is the totally different answer, but it actually gets us to the exact same point. He said, well, actually the curriculum goes first because after standardized testing's over, after we're winding down the year, people go, well, we're not testing anything else. Nobody's checking in on this. Well, everything goes. So why don't we just end school after testing? Exactly. And so then again, it's not being inspected. Therefore, it's not raising to the level. So here's here's what I'm going to say, and then everyone can lash out at me. Okay, but this is my controversial statement. <laughs> Teachers, I feel this way in my heart, and I, this is not going to be a popular statement. Ooh, hold, the, hold on. Right. Write this the down. reason we have standardized testing is because folks didn't uphold the standards. Okay. People got I lazy. Look- People got lazy. And this thinking and what we're talking about is the proof of it. Because if you're not inspected, then you're not going to do it. When in education, it should be just the opposite. We should have such a high standard for ourselves as educators and for teachers and for our students that we're meeting a higher expectation than anything that some state politician or state education board could ever expect from us. And so therefore, when we just take that test, it's just a reflection of what we know how to do already. You know, okay, I 100% believe and back that because in look, I don't know when the creation of the test was. That's something that, that I'm probably going to research at some point during the summer when we do all of, all of our Teach Bigger training. But I strongly think that because I know for a fact that the test doesn't great doesn't go over all of the teaks. They say, okay, there's there's a hundred teaks, and we're gonna we're gonna pick these twenty, and that's what this test is going to be over. It's supposed to be easy. It's not supposed to be this crazy hard thing. It's supposed to be just a like, hey, if you're doing your job, then like if I just randomly pick out these 20 teaks, then you should be able to pass this test because that should be a pretty low standard compared to what everything else you're supposed to be doing in your class. Right. Right? Well, and so, I mean, and don't get me wrong. I'm not a standardized test lover. I actually me hate, neither. I hate standardized tests. And yeah. I think it brings undue stress. I think that mm-hmm. it's way more work than what it's cut out to be. I mean, like I, I watched the past couple of weeks where my admin team basically slaved probably, I don't know, four to five hours after school hours every day just trying to prepare the actual logistics of taking those Mm -hmm. tests and i mean that's not fair that's not right so i'm not saying like standardized tests we need to keep them and let's go i hate them i I don't i don't agree Mm -hmm. with them at all but Mm -hmm. i will say you know i i was told by troy reynolds whenever he was on our show here a few weeks ago he was talking a lot about this and and we asked him kind of a similar question and he said like the the education commissioner for texas literally said If we don't test them, they won't teach. And that is a politician's perception of what teachers do. And you know what the unfortunate thing is? In many instances, that is not at all true. And people who are listening to this podcast, they're in their classrooms giving it 100% every day. They have high expectations. They do things that are great for kids. That's why this podcast exists is to highlight those teachers. But you know what? There are also folks that are just coasting and they're seeing what they can get by with. And it's leaving a bad taste in people's mouths. 
And so kind of why we're bringing this up today, because, you know, there's so many different reasons for so many different things. We can't just, we can't narrow it down and say, this is it. But what I will say is that when teachers have high expectations and they are consistent, no one will ever question if we're doing our jobs. It's true. Mm-hmm. So let's, let's kind of shift gears and say this. In these last few weeks of school, what advice can we give and what practical steps can we give to help our Teach Bigger family to feel like that they're not, you know, um, just throwing it out into the wind? but that there is a reason to keep your expectations high. And, and for me personally, I think the most important thing is those behavioral expectations to keep them high because kids need structure and kids need consistency and they need to know that what they do matters all year long. And mm-hmm. I understand. I'm not saying you don't play games with the kids or you don't take brain breaks or have fun. I, I'm not saying it has to be rigid. But what I'm saying is we can still follow our processes. We can still do our, our procedures and, and have the campus culture in place. It doesn't have to be, well, it's the last two weeks of school and it's just crazy and let's go out to recess all day. It, mm-hmm. it doesn't need to be like that. Because you know what? There are things that now that standardized testing is finished, you can actually like dive into some of those other things that you don't get time to talk about and really have fun with the kids teaching them some in-depth stuff. Yeah, that's true. Okay. So for like my class, since it's more computer based, um, it now for me, it's way easier because it, all kids love playing video games. Yeah. So, and if you know anything about what's going on in the gaming community is that you can't buy a PlayStation five and you can't play an, you can't buy an Xbox uh, series X right now. And you haven't been since basically the pandemic started when they launched them. So like everyone's trying to blah, blah. And you can't buy computer parts because there's a computer chip shortage. That's like ruining the entire world and like all these things. So what I did one day is that we, we talked about it. We talked about the computers. We talked about why there's the shortage, like what's happening, like what it takes in order to make these computer chips, uh, what you can do as an alternative. If you can't get the actual gear that you need in order to run the programs that you want, you know, I went about it in a different way. It was something that was a little bit more fun. It was a little bit more d- different. It was a little bit more uh, discussion based, something that I really like to do anyway. And then something that I also did is that about three weeks ago, I assigned my kids a really big project. Mm-hmm. Now, here's the key to this really big project. And and this is something that I've struggled with a long, uh, a long time. It's like, well, how do you know when, when it can be over? Like, how do you know that they're going to have success? Well, I created six assignments and I'm only expecting them to be able to complete four. The other two assignments are extra for the kids who I know who can achieve it. And what I'm going to do is for the, the four assignments are the ones that I'm actually going to take. That's the ones that I know very confidently that everyone should be able to accomplish. But the assignment number five and six, if you complete them, then I'm just going to replace one of their worst grades with the, with whatever the grade is with that, what they complete. And what that has done is it, it makes that my kids, when they come in, they know the expectation is still there. They know that they have work that needs to get done. And with me taking those little bit of a breaks to dive a little bit more in depth with like how Photoshop was created or something like that, it, it puts a different spin on and they don't feel like they're just coming in and work, work, work in my classroom. They come in and they know that we, we might have a discussion or something like that. So I, I'm trying to break it up, but I, I think that was the best thing because they know that their expectation is still is still there, even though it may have been adjusted according to COVID and according to everything else. So, yeah. Okay, so, you know, both of you are in teaching situations where you're kind of the only people that teach your content on your campus, okay? okay? Mm-hmm. But a lot of folks, um, you know, they are on a team. Mm-hmm. So what advice can we give to listeners who go like, you know what, I'm trying to keep the standard high, but I'm I'm the minority on my team. Like we're planning things for the last week, we're, you know, whatever we're doing, and people are just saying, well, let's just watch movies or, you know, let's let's just do this. But, you know, and not that kids can't learn that way, but maybe maybe you're sitting there going, yeah, but I really want to be able to do this, but it's a team effort. So what advice can we give, you know, our Teach Bigger teams 
to to be that voice of inspiration whenever you know sometimes it's not the most popular opinion i would say be the light in a dark room mm. mm-hmm. you know but so, so I, but what I does that like, look like what does that look like i mean like you know like if you feel and you know that um you want to keep the standard high i would say you know you need to voice your opinion and like let them know that this is why i'm doing that and then if someone argues with you and tell you and tells you that you know um to to not do that at this time then that that's questioning like their intentions and stuff like that you know like because no good teacher saying well you know it's okay just let them do let them you know like let let them have quote unquote free time or whatever if they say that then they're they should be talking taken in and evaluated about like what they really think is important anyway so um i feel like if you're on a team uh and you feel that way i say you do that because then it might also push others to be able to say you know what yeah well we can do this we i mean we can look at it this way or or have them doing this or this and this and that and use this opportunity to to be able to get this and not just let them do you know i mean what you were saying earlier is like what would you know what would our advice be uh our my advice to those teachers um like to get through the, the end of the year is keep instruction going like don't stop because the busier they are the less they have time to have behavior issues, you know? Mm-hmm. So like, maybe what you're teaching is different, but, you know, still come at it the same way because it'll make it easier for you, you know, even though we're tired and everything like that. Um, if you want to have a good end of the year, I would say keep going, like, go all the way to the end. That's what I'm doing. Yeah, I would say that because I, I, my very first year of teaching, I was a part of a team where one teacher on there was not about it. And she fought me every step of the way. And what I would say is put it back on them. And it's all about how you talk about it. So if you come in hot guns and blazing, it's just like standard confrontational, you know, um, awareness. Like if you come in guns and blazing, then they're going to come right back at you guns and blazing. But if you put it right back on them and say like, look, Hey, I have this plan. We can do this. And like, blah, blah, blah. I have it all planned out. All you have to do is do it unless you just don't want to teach the kids or, you know, don't be that passive aggressive, but you kind of you put it back on them so that way it's very obvious that they are the ones who are the lazy ones right Mm -hmm. yeah and then also if you come at it in a fun way chances are that fun and that happiness is going to be you know contagious and they're probably going to pick it up from you as well um yeah now if that fails my passive aggressive self would tell you make your class more fun and don't stop yeah. Because if your class is more fun and your kids are engaged and they're doing things and maybe they're doing something silly, but yet they're still learning, maybe they're playing games, maybe they're doing something, but they're still learning, they're still active, they're still engaged, they're still, whatever you're doing still pertains to the content, then those kids who are having free time are going to catch wind. And mm-hmm. the first thing they're going to say is, well, how come we're not doing that? That is very true because kids want to do fun stuff and kids want to learn. That is yes. Like I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions that teachers ever have is that kids don't want to learn. Kids absolutely mm-hmm. want to learn. Mm-hmm. They want to learn, but they want to learn things that interest them. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And let me tell you what: there is nothing on this planet that is as dangerous as a bored teenager. Yeah. You want to know why someone stole your your stapler? You want to know why someone destroyed your whatever? Well, it was because the teenager was bored and had nothing better to do. And let me mm-hmm. tell you something. I I one of the um, administrators that I used to work with, she brought something to my attention. She she was doing some research about cell phones because you know, like, don't have cell phones. This that and the other. And she she said that in the research she discovered that you know, people have been watching behaviors change ever since the advent of the cell phone. And so now we have like generation of kids who have literally been born, you know, with a device in front of them, basically. Yes. And that one of the tell, like, in other words, when a student, when a kid nowadays looks at a phone, what that can be interpreted is it's not that they want to look at the phone. It's that they are bored. And that is their trigger for boredom is they turn to their phone. And mm-hmm. so when you are in your class and you notice that all your kids are on the phone, that really Except should that. tell you that you're boring. Mm. Not because they want to be on the phone. Because the fact is, if you're doing something incredibly engaging, high energy, and amazing, 
that brings rel- you know that's relative to those kids and are relevant to those kids and they want to know it they're going to put down those phones and get involved mm-hmm. you know because i guarantee you with those kids that same kid on the phone you say hey let's go we're going to disney world they're going to put down that phone and they're going to head out the door mm-hmm. right because they want to do something fun Mm-hmm. Now you know. Okay, mm-hmm. for, th- that just triggered a thing. So I, I talked earlier in the season about how I had one trouble student who was always on his phone and like he was getting real mouthy to me and stuff, whatever. And then I, I eventually won him over, and he was working really hard. Well, that student made some poor choices and 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 went to DAP, mm-hmm. oh. and then because of some other issues, whatever. So now he's he's back in my class. Everything's fine, but now he's in credit recovery. Okay. And he hasn't really been on his phone since like we made that connection. We built that relationship, but now he's in credit recovery. He's a senior and he's trying to graduate. So I've allowed him to work a lot on his credit recovery stuff in my class to make sure that he graduates. Right. And he is on his phone more now than ever. And I'm always like, Hey man, look like that's not going to let you graduate. And he's like, Oh no, I know, I know. And, but you're right. It's because he's bored. Right. He was having fun doing my assignments. And now he's doing his credit recovery stuff. And now, He's bored. Right. So, you know, I was thinking back to what you guys were saying a few minutes ago about like whenever you might be on a team um, that maybe you're in the minority or, or whatever. It brought me back to a quote um, that Nick Gonzalez said a few episodes ago. And he said, how do we do it? He said, we do it by modeling. And I think that folks that are listening to this podcast, it is our commission that we model what is right, that we model the way. And sometimes you're going to be the only person doing it. But when people see it, it lets them realize the alternative. It lets them realize there is something more that we can be doing. And, you know, if you are the only person on a team that maybe is trying to hold a high standard, that is a difficult situation. And that's why with teams and, you know, working with collaborative teams or PLCs or whatever you do in in your district, it is so important that you build those relationships from the beginning of the year. And so for some of you, maybe going into next year, that needs to be a goal. Like I need to make sure that I invest in my team as people so that when we get to the end of the year and people are dragging down and they're not wanting to do the right thing, but they trust me and I can be a voice of reason or I can be a voice of encouragement and say, hey, let's try this. And people are more likely to get on board. Why? because I've built that relationship with them and they trust me. So, mm-hmm. I mean, people who listen to this podcast, you guys, you are leaders. That's why you're that's why you're listening cuz you're seeking advice, you're seeking ideas, you want to think bigger, you want to think outside of the box. And so you're coming here because it triggers your thoughts. It's not because we have all the answers, but it's because it's challenging. And so mm-hmm. you have to make sure that you're building those relationships so that you can then have more capacity to lead people in the right way. Now I'll say that when you are the, the lone ranger on your, on your team, that's trying to uphold the standard, you thought you were tired before Mm -hmm. you get ready because upholding that standard when you are the only person and everybody else around you is taking the easy way out. It is hard. Yeah. It'll be the hardest thing that you'll ever do probably because there's nothing worse than knowing that you are right and everyone telling you that you're insane or that you're dumb, Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. you know that this is what it needs to be and no one's following you and and maybe they're even treating you bad. Maybe they're talking Mm -hmm. down about you. Maybe they're talking down about you into your face, but holding that standard because you know what it's supposed to be, that'll be tough. And I'm going to tell you right here, It'll be worth it, and the way you get through it is by remembering that there will be an end date. One day the school year will end, yeah. and your kids will probably do better than theirs, and you will be more tired to them. And the fact that you're more tired than them shows that you worked harder mm-hmm. because well, you upheld the standard they didn't. Yeah, you know. and at the end of the day, you have to keep your mission in mind. Like You're doing this for children. You're doing it for kids because it's what's best for kids not because it's what's popular for teachers you know Mm -hmm. like our jobs are to better kids not to make ourselves comfortable and we are in a job of service it's a job of service and that means sacrifice and it can be really hard but it's worth it Mm -hmm. so well i hope that today really 
gives you a perspective. If you've been struggling through the end of the year or, or maybe just frustrated about situations, you know, those things are going to happen. But we've got to pick each other up and carry each other along to the end of the race, you know, and it's almost here. We're about to get to have a break. So thanks for listening today. Thanks for tuning in. I hope that today's episode challenges you. Uh, I will say this also. I was thinking about this a few seconds ago as we were talking. You know, I do and I am a fan of kids getting to do fun things at the end of the year. You know, when testing is over and, and you know, those major milestones are over, it is worthy to celebrate. And um, I will say that taking brain breaks in your transitions and doing some different things to just kind of change it up a little and give those kids an outlet, whether they're in elementary school, middle school or high school, they all need it. It just looks different at every level. But um, I have put together um, and it's it's centered toward elementary school, but I've put together a um, kind of a Google Slides presentation. It's not really presentations. It's more of like a menu of options to do for brain breaks. And if, um, if you're kind of wanting some ideas or whatever, if you will email me at info at teachbigger.com, or if you'd prefer to reach out on social media, you can always reach out to me that way. Um, our, our, um, what is that called? Handle? Our name. Social media, our, yeah, our handle. Our yeah, social our social media, media handle. Um, it's Teach Bigger all across the board, whether you're on Facebook, whether you're on Instagram, whether you're on Twitter, it's all at Teach Bigger. So you can reach out to us that way, and I would be more than happy to share um, that presentation with you, and that would give you a few things to do here at, toward the end of the year, and, and maybe it would take you, um, you know, it'll save you some time in trying to do all that research. So thanks again for tuning in. Reach out to us if you have questions, if you have ideas for the show. Um, if you've if you've missed some episodes, feel free to subscribe to the podcast so that way you know um, every time we have a new episode and you can go back and listen to some of the, the episodes that we've had this this um, season. It's, it's been some good guests and some good things going on. So we will have one more episode next week um, and we'll wrap up season number four. We'll be taking a little break this summer and coming back in August for season five. So thanks again for listening. And we'll be back with you here next week. And remember, go out and do something big.